Thank you for that wonderful applause. <laughs> I like that. Uh, I'm Jim Halterman. I'm the West Coast Bureau Chief for TV Guide Magazine. Good to see everybody. What did you think of the episode? Oh my God. I am not allowed to give spoilers, but wait until you see the next one. It's really good. Um, but I'm, we, we came here to talk to these wonderful guys. So <laughs> talk to uh, Robin Lord Taylor <laughs> and Corey Michael Smith. Hi, everybody. <laughs> How you guys doing? Thanks for coming out. For, do you guys watch the episodes? Like, I know you guys are busy a lot, but do you actually watch the episodes as they air? Or? As often as we can, yeah. yeah. We, you know, we like the the live tweeting and the whole thing. Like, yeah, it, it's it's part of the thing now, and yeah, it, it's good for the show and it's fun to do. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I always like to back up a little bit, so we Great. will get to Gotham. But first, I want to talk about just your early careers and what was that first time you guys were on stage or actually performed in anything. How old were you? When was it? Oh, man. I think, well, the first time, that it was fourth grade, and it was in reading group, and we read Ramona Quimby, age eight. And then <laughs> the teacher said, she was like, you know, make a little play about it. And so we wrote a little play, and we staged it in front of the classroom. And that was the first time where I had th even thought about acting, or even like, even like considered it a thing that I could possibly do. And it was, of course, just in front of like 25 other fourth graders, you know what I mean? So wait, so. were you Ramona, Bezos? Who were you? Who, I, I was Howie. Howie, yes. Yeah, right. yeah totally. So, I yeah. know that series. How about you, Corey? Uh, I was in um, sixth grade, and we had the, I'm from Columbus, Ohio, and we have a, uh, a theater company through the children's hospital called Pleasure Guild. Um, Children's Hospital, and they uh, they do a really great, a uh, cool production, and they use one of the big theater houses downtown. So it's like a 2,000, 2,500 seat house. It's the Palace Theater. It's gorgeous. It's like based on Versailles. So my very first production was playing Edmund in Narnia on that stage, and I remember the first time I walked out, and I was like, "Oh shit! Oh my god!" I was like, this is so real. And I, lo I loved it. I had so much fun. We, there's a videotape of that. Seriously? Yeah, I should, bring, I should oh, share it with you. Yeah, I, need to see I know. Unfortunately, we don't have it here today. We, yeah. Next, next Jeez, time. Please. Oh, I'm not Go sharing ahead. it with the general public. <laughs> I'm just going to share it with Robin. <laughs> it's embarrassing. It's, and so what was, the, what was that early journey like? Did you, were you guys involved with theater just throughout high school, college, the whole works? Yeah, for me, it was mostly, it was all, I, I grew up in a small town in Iowa. And there was community theater around, but I really, um, I, it was mostly yeah junior high school, high school you know and then and then college eventually so yeah you, Corey. yeah I, I did theater in high school, uh, but I did marching band in in the fall so I could Me only too. do the spring musical, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I didn't I didn't really want to be an actor necessarily in in high school, uh, but then I I did a I did a play um, during the winter uh, a tuna Christmas you guys know the tuna plays. Um, it's it there. It's a series of plays that take place in Tuna, Texas, and it's it's a two-hander. So it's two actors, but each actor plays like fifteen to twenty roles or something. It's it's a little slapstick, and it's super super fun and really funny. And we did that. Um, of course, we hired more or not hired. We had more than two actors in high school play this, but they gave me six different roles to do, and it was the first time where I was like keyed into like oh. I like have an innate ability to like create different people and like separate them and like create that. And so I, I kind of was like, oh, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this. I think I can do this. Well, it's funny because we all come from the Midwest. Cause I'm from Indiana. When, hey, when yeah. did you guys kind of decide? Because I feel like there is a moment where you're kind of like, you know what? If I'm going to do this, I have to leave and go wherever you go. But what was your journey to like? really get things going professionally. Yeah, I, well for me, it, I, I, I come from a family of actuaries, which <laughs> it's not actors, actuaries. Which is <laughs> very different. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're math people and, and they, you know, anyway. So they, they didn't really, they, they had a different idea of what I should do with my life. But, uh, so, so, but regardless, when I applied for schools, when I was looking, you know, for, at college, I, uh, I, I knew that I wanted to go to Northwestern and when you apply, yes, when it, yes, go cats, nice. Oh. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, I don't know if you, uh, I, I don't know if it's still this way, but when I applied, uh, you have to declare your major when you apply. And it was like, oh, I don't know what the heck I want to do, you know, but I didn't know that theater was the only thing that I got personal satisfaction out of. And I was thinking, you know, okay, well, if, you know, I can always go. If it doesn't work out, I'll change it, you know. And also part of what I'm coming at, too, is that I was, like I said, from a very small town in Iowa. And uh, Northwestern is a very, very big, big school. And the theater department is, you know, very, very popular and very well renowned. And so I was thinking also, like, I didn't know if I had the chops. Like, I didn't know, because I knew I was going to be going to school with kids who went to Crossroads and Harvard Westlake and all of those are the like, I'm thinking of LA schools. But, uh, and like, you know, and, you know, the, the High School of Performing Arts in New York City. Like, these are kids who, like, were in theater and, and a lot of them had worked in television and done, you know, the professional stuff. I didn't know if I could stand with them, but then when I got there, and I started auditioning, I was getting cast, and I, you know, and I started believing in myself, and then, you know, from then, yeah, and here, moved to New York after that. How about you, Corey? What was the actual question? I'm sorry. <laughs> when, no, when was that, uh, that first big step you took to actually make acting in a professional career? Cause oh, uh, I, well, I went, I went to college, and I, I uh, studied acting and piano, and I almost I almost changed my major a uh, few times because uh, I really I I enjoyed I enjoyed college I was just kind of horrified at the idea of um, of making a, a career uh, because I I think I there were certain things that I wanted to do and I didn't know if I had the capacity to withstand the sort of um, the drudgery that can come uh, pursuing this career for so many people. And uh, I have so much respect for the drive and I didn't know if I, if my, I didn't know if I had the patience. Um, so I was afraid of that. So I, I, I almost switched to philosophy a couple times and decided to go like study philosophy and potentially religion and go into law and do that sort of thing. Um, but I, Senior year, I went to Otterbein, which is a tiny uh, liberal arts school in Ohio. Um, and our senior year, we do a casting internship. And so I went to New York City and I interned at CBS Primetime Casting during pilot season. So for 10 weeks, I sat in every day watching people audition for TV shows. And a couple things happened. One, I realized how friggin' pretty so many people are. I'm like, <laughs> You know, I'm like sitting, you know, this is like before I figured out like really like how I can do my hair and like I didn't, you know, I like didn't know really how to dress. I've lived in Columbus for like 22 years. So I'm like flipping through these pictures just going, oh my God, this is awful. This is awful. These people are so pretty. Uh, but then I, you know, I was sitting in these auditions and I was so astonished at how unprepared so many people were. Uh, or just not memorized, like very simple, simple things. Um, incapable of keeping eye contact, can't walk in a room and feel comfortable and say, hey, to the casting director, or come in and act like an asshole or pompous. Or, you know, all these like things that seem pretty, I don't know, pretty simple. And I was like, oh, wow. If I like check off all of these little things at the top, which have nothing to do with skill and talent, it's just about being a good human and prepared. It was like, I'm going to be better than a large percentage of these people. So if I can just figure out how the hell to do my hair, <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> this is going to be great. Get a nice shirt. Uh, so I was like, I, I got a little bit of confidence from that. And then, um, and then we did a showcase at, uh, a few weeks after I finished internship. And I I uh, started working with an agent that was predominantly, it was a medium-sized agent, predominantly a theater agent. Um, and as soon as I graduated, which was a couple months later, I moved to New York and, uh, and then I, I booked my first job uh, after a couple months and it was a regional theater production. I got my equity card and I was like, all right, I think I'm like, it was just a, a vote of confidence. I was like, I'm going to keep, I can do this. This is, this is a really good start and I, I felt like I was on the right path. What, what was the first SAG job you got? Uh, my first SAG job, so I did theater for a while. I did theater for um, three and a half or four years uh, before I did anything on, on camera. My first SAG job was a, an independent film that I shot in uh, August of 
2013. It's called Camp X-Ray, uh, written and directed by this guy, Peter Sattler, who's super cool. Um, it was his first feature, and it was starring Kristen Stewart and uh, co-starring this guy, Payman Maudi, uh, who's a Pakistani actor who's in The Night Of. He plays the father of um, the young guy. Uh, Super cool dude. It was pretty much a two-hander, but there was this group. Uh, there, she's. Um, it's about. Uh, it's about soldiers stationed at Guantanamo Bay, um, and Payman was a, a detainee. And it was very much based on this National Geographic uh, documentary there. So it was less about the war and more about the relationship between one soldier and a detainee. Um, but there was like you know a group of soldiers there that were kind of highlighted, and I was cast as one of them. Um, that was my first job. Nice. Robin, what was your first SAG job? New York Lottery commercial, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All about a flip phone, because that's when we were doing this. I think it was, two, uh, when was this? This would have been uh, like October, November of 2000. Were, were you a winner in the commercial, or were you just looking at your phone? I was like, it was. I was just like a one of like three like kids sitting on the side of the thing, and someone had a. It was something about a phone. I don't know. It was like really. It was yeah. I know. It was, and that was the first time I like learned about like insert shots because there were just all these shots of my hand just flipping the phone open and like you know doing that <laughs> over and over. I was like, oh, I think I can handle this. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you're acting. You've got agents. Your representation. And a script comes along your way that's kind of about Batman. What what was your first impression when you first found out about this and and like you know found out about the roles? We that didn't you were know play? anything about it. They didn't. We didn't have a script. We didn't have. We they wrote dummy scenes with uh, where they changed the characters' names and uh, and you know it was, I, I, maybe Holly can tell me it was something like the Untitled Warner Brothers project or something like it, it like had a very wasn't called Goth Gotham or anything. So, which was a really brilliant thing that they did in the sense that like, they really wanted people to come to the auditions like not trying to recreate what had happened before. And so I think that that's a lot of the reason why we were doing scenes that weren't, you know, it wasn't like the Oswald Cobblepot scene. It was like Paul or some random name. And like, and it, it, it was basically the essence of the character, but you know, it just, you know, it didn't have the name or you didn't, you didn't know it was connected to the Batman w world. So in that brilliant way, Bruno Heller and Danny Cannon were able to cast the show. Like, you know, and they, I just come in with this scene and I was like, I just made my choices as I would any other scene, you know, like, and what they saw, what the choices that I made just happened to, like gel with what they were seeing for the character too. So it was very like, yeah. Does that actually happen a lot? Have you guys experienced that a lot? And I, well, you don't really know what you're reading for, but they just tell you do this and you kind of do it. Yeah. Um, well, what, what was the other thing? Oh, I, uh, I, uh, Breaking Bad did that a lot. I, uh, I mean, I knew it was break. I knew I was auditioning for Breaking Bad, but they wouldn't tell you what the character was and the, the scene was, you know, from something else. They just wrote the scene for the audition. It wasn't, like, part of the script. And the same with Walking Dead. Like, there, those, those three shows all kind of did it the same way. Yeah. So when did you guys find out what it was? Like, do you not find out till you actually get the part? And they say, oh, by the way, this is what you're going to be doing. My experience was a little different. I knew what I was auditioning for. Uh, uh, so I, and I knew what the role was. So I... I knew they were casting it, but they they auditioned uh, Penguin way before Nigma. I was one of the last people cast because the you know season one was so much predominantly his you know about the rise of the Penguin. Um, so I was more of an ancillary character uh, for season one. So I kind of knew by that time. Um, but uh, that was that the answer to the question. God, I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> we've been doing. We, you think I was doing drunk. press I'm all not. day? It's like <laughs> you, your brain, just like oh yeah, no. At least your hair looks good. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes, and the shirt. Now the question was just really when when you found out what you were auditioning for, but oh. obviously you you had an idea. But yeah, so yeah. the the follow up then would be, how did you not get too much in your head as far as other source material that you may or may not have seen? Oh, um, well, I had not seen either the '60s. TV show, or um, and I think it's the only Jim Carrey movie that I've not watched, luckily. Uh, and I spent most of my childhood impersonating him, so it's probably a good thing that I didn't see it. Uh, I was I wasn't really concerned about it, and also the the dummy side that they had written was so well written and so specific, and it was the language was really wonderful, the situation 
uh, was great. It was just this guy, uh, this he was a forensic scientist, like looking at this tiny little piece of hair and flirting with a female cop uh, over this piece of hair and like showing off his knowledge. Uh, <laughs> and she was not amused, but he didn't realize that. He couldn't like key into that. So there was so much information in the side. So I was just like inspired by the side and the fact that he was so into minutia and so unaware of someone else and what they thought of him. There's just a lot of information. So I just like leaned into what the scene was and like trusted that if I did that character and turn the volume up because it's going to be a Batman world, then that's that's what I presented. Well, Robin, well, how about you? Once you, once you knew what you were playing, did a lot of stuff get kind of stuck in your head? Whether I mean, there's a lot of different people who played Penguin. I think of Burgess Meredith because I grew up watching Batman. Oh, yeah, totally. And me too. Yeah, but, every day. But how do I guess? How do you navigate? Kind of honoring some of that, but also not letting it get in the head for what you want to do. Well, you know, similar to what Corey said, it was very clear from the sides that it was this was something totally different than what had happened, what had come before. It was very because we know, you know, the Danny DeVito performance, fantastic, but also it's a Tim Burton treatment, so it's a lot more fantastic. It's not as rooted in, you know, reality as much as th this scene was that we were given. Uh, so there was that, and then also, and the same with with Burgess Meredith, as genius as he was. I mean, it was that's it's a fun, more of a camp comic performance, you know. And I knew that this was going to be so different. And also, so I, I did, I did actually know the night before I went in to read with the dummy side, the, my first time auditioning. My agent called me, and she was like, "Just so you know, this is the prequel to Batman, and it's called Gotham, and you're playing the Penguin, but don't let the <laughs> like don't let that freak you out." You know? And I was like, oh, okay. But see, this is like, you know, yeah, right. This like comes from like, so this had been like, f you know, 14 years of like auditioning. And, you know, I'd, you know, I'd worked before, but like I'd gotten close to this, uh, you know, by far the biggest project, one of the biggest projects I, I'd ever auditioned for. But I mean, I, there had been other ones before. And, you know, after 14 years of a lot, a lot of rejection, I, I was getting really good at just sort of like, you know, like shutting out the noise and just being like, all right, I'm going in. I'm just going to go in and do make my choices and do what I decided, you know, the choices that I made for the scene. I'm just going to, you know, and you, you, you learn to sort of, you know, filter out that noise. I mean, it's sort of a, it's a survival mechanism, you know, because it's like you get so, like you're constantly, you, ever, you, you all know this, you know, you're constantly, you know, faced with like, you know, at these constantly at a crossroads when you audition for projects like this, it's like my life could go in this direction, or we could just sort of stay right here and like go <laughs> like that. You know what I mean? Like, so it, it take, to live in that in that world, you know, is is a really unique experience. You know, it's like only actors can really understand. Uh, well, artists and performers can really understand that. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's just you know, tempering expectations and 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 believing in yourself, and also like you know. I, I had gotten to the point. I'm sorry. sorry. I, I'd gotten to the point where, like, I looked at auditions as I started it. I embraced at this point. I was embracing the audition process and looking at it like, okay, this might be my five-minute performance for the next two weeks, you know, and treating it like, like the same I would treat being on a giant set or being on Broadway or being, you know, like you learn to treat those performances as like something to be enjoyed and to be embraced, you know. It's like, and you you realize also like if you're not right for the job, you know. It doesn't matter if, if you're right, the casting director, if, you, if, if they like what you've done, even if you're not right for the job, they will keep you in mind and bring you back in. So it's, you know, it's all of that. Yeah. Well, ha having watched the show from the pilot, you guys both bring such a unique physicality to the roles. <laughs> and I'm curious if that's intensely thought out or is it more organic that comes out once you just have thought about the character? Talk about both your experiences. Corey, let's start with you. Uh, yeah, well, I, I knew, I had talked to um, the creator of the show, Bruno Heller, uh, for a while, well actually it wasn't necessarily a conversation. Bruno, I was on the phone and I just listened for 15 minutes and like scribbled onto a, a legal pad every word that he was saying because we didn't have the script ahead of time and all we had was the first script and I had like one scene that was going to last for like 25 seconds and I'm like how the, am I supposed to build a character off of this? This is insane. You know, I'm like if you have a theater script or a film script, you know, it's like the entire canvas is in front of you and you're like, all right, that's what it looks like. That is the trajectory of this character. And now I get to like fill in everything else. But I'm like, 
you know, looking at a canvas, I don't know where the end is, and it's like, it's like a little ink blot right here. And I was like, I don't know what to do with this. So I was like, Bruno, you got to help me out here. And he was like, well, here's what we're thinking of doing with, with Ed. And it was, he, you know, talked about, um, you know, having me look up, like, autism and Asperger's and, like, what, what those qualities are in a human being and what it's like to... Uh, have difficulty with social aptitude, um, you know, uh, being a man that still behaves like a boy, you know, he was um, sexually inexperienced, just very, very undeveloped. Uh, he had a lot of effort and a lot of energy that was misplaced and people didn't understand it and he didn't understand why people didn't understand it. Uh, and so that's like where we started. And so for me, it was about have someone having so much energy that was quite childlike. Uh, um, and so like, how do you expel that? And for me, it was about, uh, you know, where does he hold his tension and how does he relieve his tension? And so for me, a lot of it was based off of the audition side. He was someone that was like really into like detail and like talking about detail. And so for me, uh, I found a lot, you know, like things, if you're, if you're de uh, like motor skills, if you're dealing with something that's like really tiny, you know, you're dealing with like fingertips. So everything for me became like uh, feeling things like really small, like often I'll run my fingernails between, uh, like my fingerprints, like I'll trace my fingerprints on my finger with my fingernails, a way to like try to focus my attention to myself while I'm talking to someone. Uh, or for me, facially, um, you know, he has so much effort and he doesn't know what to do with it, so I needed a lot of mouth tension for him to like uh, try to force things out and also, uh, you know, when he's afraid, like not sure what he wants to say, like that he just gets like really tight and he tries to hold it in with like his like parts of his lips. So everything to me was just about like finding really, really specific tiny parts of my body that I would try to control bigger emotions with. And obviously he would eventually lose control. Now I have other texts because he's changed so much, but that's, that's where I started. Great. How about you, Robin? Uh, it was really organic for me, I guess, if, if that's the best way to put it. I mean, I also, you know, I was really fortunate in terms of like, so, you know, there's the limp and the waddle and all of that. And the fact that that was an actual physical injury that he received, it wasn't just sort of weird affectation, you know, that was put on, you know, he, you know, he had his leg or his foot broken by Fish Mooney in the first episode and didn't heal correctly. And then I, you know, I checked in with like the director and I talked to the stunt uh, coordinator just to see like, okay, is this the kind of injury, if it didn't heal correctly, what would that look like? And, and we collaborated on that. And then uh, Danny Cannon, the day we had to shoot the scene where, where, you know, we're walking down the pier in the first episode and it's the first time you see his, his waddle. And Danny was like, okay, show me what you got. And I like busted it out and he was like, 10% less. And I was like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, like, I'm like ten percent. Okay, and then that's what it—that's what it turned out to be. But uh, but also like another thing that really uh, was a huge influence were, was the is the wardrobe. I mean, just you, and you know, every, it's such an amazing tool to have, and it says so much insight into the character. This is someone who gets up in the morning and puts on a three-piece suit. 365 days out of the year, you know what I mean? This is, there's that, that's like loungewear for him. And so it's just, and you know, like when you put on a suit, when you, or if you're wearing, if you're wearing a dress or any, anything you're wearing informs your posture, informs, you know, just how you carry yourself. When you walk into a room and you're wearing like something like incredibly ornate and expensive and intense, like that changes your energy too. And it, it informs so much about the character. So the wardrobe was really helpful. Well, something Corey said so true. You, the characters have changed so much. It's, yeah. almost, it's almost like, wow, we're only at season, then this is season three. I know, they're but big so much seasons. has happened. <laughs> but I guess, how would you guys characterize season three as far as your characters and what we're going to see beyond this episode? Okay. Uh, well, uh, it's season three. Uh, so at the end of season two, uh, Fish Mooney's back in, in Gotham, and she, uh, she and Oswald have a moment. She lets him live. Uh, and so, and then, so when we start season three, you guys, know, huh? the monsters are going crazy, <laughs> and she has rallied them. She is the leader of them, and just Oswald had lost so much of himself in season two, what with the the death of his parents, and also the the torture he received in Arkham, 
at the hands of Hugo Strange, that going into season three, seeing Fish Mooney, knowing she's back in, t in town, gives him, uh, brings him back to himself and gives him a focus, something that he can focus his energy on. And uh, go so going forward, because she is there and she's given him this focus, he now has uh, the drive and the ambition to become not only one of the most powerful uh, crime bosses in Gotham City, but really one of the most powerful people in all of Gotham City. Someone who will influence every single character. And so that's a lot of where we're going this year. <laughs> I have to say, I missed it when, when Jada left the show for a while in season two. I missed her. And yeah. so it was really fun to see her back. And I'm glad she's back for a while in here. Um, how was it to work with her? Because you guys have really intense scenes, but you're also playing these over-the-top characters. So how was it to kind of just do that with her? Oh my gosh, it was incredible. And she is, uh, she's an incredibly kind, giving actor. You know, she's like one of the, you know, again, this is like the, one of the biggest jobs I've ever had. And she's like one of the biggest stars that I've ever worked so intimately with. And so like when I showed up, I mean, I was terrified. I didn't know what, <laughs> I didn't know, you know, and you also like read things about famous people that are, 99% of it is made up bullshit but you don't you don't know and like i was coming in with like maybe expectations of things that i had read or like had seen and like you know i was super worried and then the second you walk on on set she's like come over and give me a hug and like you know that's the kind of person that she is she all of that all of that pretense is just completely dropped she's like completely kind and giving and uh and yeah and also like what i love about my connection my character's connection with her is that you know he is he learned everything he knows from her Granted, he used it against her, but she will always be like his influence. She, he's, she's always the she's the reason why he is who he is. He owes everything to her. So yeah, it's great. I love it. I love it. Um, how would you guys describe your relationship at this point in the show? Because I love the scene you have in this episode. But I don't know if it's a friendship, a bromance. Is it just you guys using each other? I don't know what it is. How, how would you describe it? Well, it's. I mean, this this season is. Uh, I mean the. There's going to be a lot of changes to the relationship this season. Uh, it's it's very exciting. I mean, we we just we're like wrapping up episode seven, and already it's like wild. Uh, but uh, you know the the first this first scene in in season three that we have, you know, Oswald is clearly being generous and kind, and um, I am grateful because at, in the last time we saw each other in season two, I kicked him out because he had been kind of brainwashed and was nice, and I was like, what is that? Uh, so he has every right to like seek retribution for that, which is one of his habits. Uh, so I'm a little suspicious of his kindness, but uh, as we move forward, um, you know, I do get out of Arkham. <laughs> you know, not to spoil things, but... Uh, I mean, I can't just stay in there. Nothing's happening in there. Uh, so um, I, I do get out, and once I'm out, we are spending a lot of time together. And I'm, you know, I the the nice thing for me in season three is when I am out, I am kind of uh, absolved of all my crimes and murders that I've committed, which is, you know, in less than a year, I'm out, and I'm like, well. <laughs> That's, it's kind of an amazing place to be for someone who's changed so much in two years and is now rebirthed and he has a clean slate and he gets to kind of decide now who he wants to be and what that looks like. It's a really cool place to be. I think, I think from Penguin's standpoint, uh, you know, he lost, like I said, he lost the two people that he loves, that he ever loved, his mom and his, and his father in the first season, or in the, in the second season. And I... Uh, and so, you know, the the only other person who ever showed him any sort of kindness or, or uh, just care, at all was, was Edward Nigma. And I think also the only other person that that Oswald sees as an intellectual equal, uh, is Edward Nigma. And and Oswald is one of those people where he would like to keep the people that have the potential to, you know, hurt him, he'd like to actually keep them close. And so I think that's a lot going into the beginning, or into uh, when he comes to Arkham to see Edward. It's like he wants to foster that friendship. He wants to have a friend. He wants to connect with someone. And how appropriate that he connects with another person who has been ostracized and, and thrown out and, like, you know, treated like less of a human being by his peers. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, I think. So, yeah. 
Okay, so it's okay to ship you guys. So hashtag nipple pot. Is that what we could call nipple it? Pot. Nipple pot. Nipple <laughs> pot. It's called <laughs> nig mobble pot. <laughs> And it's oh, so Nygma. it's already out there. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. Know, and there's knows. also, then there, then there's <laughs> Nig Mobble Pot. Like Nigma. Nigma Cobble Pot. Cobble pot. Okay. Nig so, Mobble Pot. You know, right. right. It just rolls right off the top. We've also been, <laughs> <laughs> we've also been shipped in, they call it shipping, you know, yes. they call it, it's been, yes. we've been shipped in real life, and that's called Smaler. So. Yeah. Smith <laughs> and Taylor. My, my, my husband doesn't like that one as much. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. We do have a lot of questions from the audience. Let's get right. to some of those. Uh, Bill Cates, where's Bill? Hey, Bill. Hey, Bill. Um, for Robin, how much of a surprise was it for you when they cast Paul Rubens as your father? Oh, my and, God. and can we expect to see him again? Uh, well, you never know. I mean, he's dead, but that doesn't really mean a lot in yeah. Gotham. So, you know. Doesn't matter. But, uh, but I, it was incredible. <laughs> so I'll tell the story as fast as I possibly can. So, Carol Kane plays my mom. Uh, just the best, the best, the best. Yes, she is incredible. Uh, and so, anyway, she and Paul have been best best friends. She was his date to Batman Returns. So, like, they've been best friends for so many years. She was by his side throughout all of the controversies. She never let, you know, she never gave up on her friends. So, you know, coincidentally, you know, this was, uh, I think, yeah, this was the beginning of season two. Uh, she... We're neighbors in New York, and she called. She emailed me, and she was like, "Let's go have lunch." And I was like, "Great." And then she was like, "My friend Paul's coming," and I was like, "Okay, who, who the hell's Paul? <laughs> Whatever." I'm like, fine. And I walk in, and there's Paul Rubens. This is before they cast him in the show, and I and so and but we spent the whole the whole br breakfast or lunch. What did I say? Whatever it was, brunch. Uh, talking about uh, how amazing it would be for Paul to play my father. Like now that Carol has played my mother, Paul should play my father. He played the father in Batman Returns. It'd be this amazing crossover. We talk about it all brunch long. Then we go out front and we take a little family photo together as kind of a joke. And, uh, and so then as, you know, maybe I think it was the next day I, te I texted Danny Cannon, our executive producer, the photo, and he wrote back immediately, OMFG, I've been trying to get Paul to play your father for the last three weeks. So this is a total coincidence. Like, you, you know, and so like when it actually happened, I mean, I just, I just about fell over. I mean, it was just really amazing. And then to be, you know, just to be sitting, you know, on set across from Paul Rubens looking at that face that I had been looking at since I was nine years old. You know, it, it's like, it was just just a dream come true. Do you think a, he was auditioning, like he knew and he was auditioning it's you? It's entirely possible. Knowing I've Paul, never thought that about this until now. You, would do. you know, I really didn't, I had to call him. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. He, he would do that. He would absolutely do that. Yeah. Wait, we haven't, we haven't met Nygma's parents, have we? We might. Oh. <laughs> Just right. saying. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll talk to the Warner Brothers people for Who'd the exclusive want? on that. Who should we secret to be your parents? Who oh, I don't would know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Okay. 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 We'll let you off the hook. It. All right. Next question. Okay. Who, who who wrote down their name was Bruce Wayne? Who's Bruce who Wayne? That? Okay. Hey, there he is. Are you Bruce Wayne? Oh, awesome. oh my God! God. Yeah. That is awesome. Applause for Bruce Wayne. That's so good. Yes. Welcome, Bruce. <laughs> Hi. Um, we talked about this a little bit, but um, how much of the comics do you bring to to your craft in the role? Whether it's the comics or you know just the lore, because it's not just the TV show, the movies. These go back even further. Do you bring any of that to the what you're doing? Definitely. I mean, we, it would be I think so foolish not to, just because. You know, how lucky do we get to be having 77 years of material to draw upon? I mean, it's brilliant. Like, the fact, like, you know, I never expected to be part, well, I just wanted to be part of any show. And then to be part of a show that has been around for so, for, for this long as so, these characters are, you know, indelible. Like, you know, it, it, uh, yeah, again, I think it would be foolish not to look at the comics. And so, so yeah, I, I was, we're, and we're really fortunate in that Jeff Johns, the head of DC, is very much involved in our show. He signs off on all of the storylines. And he, when we were first cast, like, I got to meet him at some event, a Warner Brothers event. And, uh, and I was like, you know, if you, if you have any, like, ideas for, you know, Penguin-centric storylines or, or, you know, from from past comic books, let me know, and I'll go get them. And he was like, what's your address? And then he hand-selected like three or four comics that talked about, you know, Penguin's past and sent them to my house. And, and that was incredible. That's where I learned that, you know, Oswald was, you know, a, a, 
horrifically bullied as a child, like and and really all the way up through his adolescence and even into his young adulthood, uh, that informs so much about the character to me. And then you know, and and million other things, you know, like little things that you wouldn't know from watching, you know, the Adam West series or or the Batman Returns series. Yeah, Corey, how about you? Uh, I I didn't read comics as a kid, uh, so when I got this job, I uh, jumped into them. Uh, fearing that I might end my career early by ruining this <laughs> this opportunity. Um, so I, I started devouring comics, and the thing that stuck out to me was that over the many decades that uh, the Riddler has been a character, every time a new artist came on or a new writer, the character changed um, quite a bit. Um, and especially from like the 50s to now, the kind of darkness of the Riddler completely changed. He used to be all fun and games uh, and was quite family friendly and now he's uh, quite horrifying. Um, and so that was really interesting to me and I was like, well, I felt a sort of allowance to to kind of, you know, lean into my own version of the Riddler, uh, you know, distill the DNA of the character. You know, what are the things that are consistent? What are the things that I love? Like his glee, which stands out from a lot of the other villains. Um, you know, there, there were certain things that I loved that were consistent, but otherwise I was like, well, I, I, I think it's, you know, I can do my own, we can put our own, uh, you know, fingerprint on this and, and hopefully people enjoy this one as, you know, one of their, one of their faves. Cool. Uh, Stephanie That's Young? Yeah, yes. exactly, thank you, Bruce. Awesome. Where's Stephanie Young? Hi, Stephanie. Hi. Um, actually, I'm going to ask both of you this. Is it hard to leave the character behind when you leave set for the day? Um, you know, I, I use the, 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 I have the makeup. I have a very intense makeup process uh, with the prosthetic nose. And then that, along with the wardrobe and the hair and, you know, and also the, the limp and all of that, there's so much physicality that goes into the transformation that I really use, I use that time, you know, when I, when going through the works, going through the makeup and the hair and, the, and putting on the clothes, that's me, I use that to inspire me to get into character and then at the end of the day, I get to take it all off, put it away until I need to, you know, access it again. So in that way, it's it's relatively simple. I mean, it's in it's an it's a nice sort of transition in and out of the character, which I feel very fortunate about. Yeah. Uh it hasn't been too difficult uh this this role to leave behind for me either. Uh and I think a lot of that actually has to do with the fact that we film in New York, which is a city that I've lived in for a while. Um I've done other projects where uh, the character has been um, quite consuming for me and very difficult. And I've been, uh, you know, like on the North Shore of Massachusetts, like staying in a hotel room, eating hotel food, you know, and it's like there's nothing about the experience that feels like home. I can't retreat from the job. I don't get to go home. Uh, but in this city, I, I do. Um, so that's actually been... It's been very helpful. I will say one thing that's interesting is, so uh, last season, you, you know, he gets brainwashed and then he becomes, he becomes like, you see who he, who he is underneath all of that, all of the scars and all of the horrible, you know, experiences that he's had. You see this like really sad, kind, gentle, person who is rather pathetic and you know and and it's funny like and so I would have so I would come home from work and we would sh have great days and like you know the stuff every, everything would go really well and but I would still have this like sort of lingering like yeah okay it's I guess today went really well and I'm you know like you know kind of this residual but I don't know yeah, and it and but then I come home when I'm when I'm like nasty penguin and I start kicking butt and like killing people and like being like real jerk about the whole thing. Like, I come home and I'm like, we could be working for like 15 hours and I'm like, let's go out. Let's go to the club. I am ready to party. You know what I mean? And it's true, like, that that does actually stay with me. Like, the, those sort of residual, like, your adrenaline really gets going when you're fake stabbing someone like a thousand times all day long. So, yeah, like, yeah, then, so that's, it is. I'm also, yes, totally. My cat is there. My husband's there. I've lived there for over 16 years now. So, yeah, it's it's great. Yeah, it's definitely the cat. Oh my gosh, I walk in the door and he's lying on my face. Okay, I'm gonna squeeze in one last question. Um, t real quick, what what was your favorite episode thus far? 
Do you have one? Uh, uh, yeah, I, well, yeah, I would say... Um, that was from Andre, by the way. Thank you, Andre. Thanks, Andre. Hi. Uh, my favorite episode so far would be uh, episode 16 from season two. That is the episode where uh, Paul Rubin's character passes away. Um, there is a lot of uh, direct... <laughs> direct parallels to my to my to my life and to my own father i uh, and i uh, i i have to say that it is my favorite episode it's the one episode that i will never watch okay how about you Corey? uh i the the one um directly after that 217 um in 215 i kind of for like a the, an episode i went like full on riddler uh, and I didn't realize it, but I did this big elaborate framing of Jim Gordon. Um, and then it didn't really, I didn't really, it didn't go perfectly. And so in 2.17 uh, is when he is kind of on my tail and I'm like, I got to wipe him out. I got to wipe him out. He's got to go. Um, and I had these two great scenes, which you just don't often get in television when like, you know, scenes like gotta move, they gotta move, gotta keep people interested. But I had this scene with Jim Gordon in my apartment that was so long and it was so delicious. And he's like, he comes over with this recording because I had called um, to help set up the framing. I had called and reported him as having killed someone. And I, and he had the recording. And he brings it over because the recording is messy. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, I'll clean this for you. And I bring out the equipment and he's sitting there and I'm like, we're, I'm making us tea and we're trying to figure that out. Like that scene was so delicious for me. And then he escapes from my apartment and then we're out uh, in the woods and I'm digging up Kristen Kringle's body because I think he's on to it. And the thing that was brilliant, the day or the weekend before we shot this, we had the second largest blizzard ever in New York City. And so there were 26 point some inches of snow out in the, out in the woods where we were. And of course I had to wear, you know, I'm like wearing, it's always November in Gotham regardless of the weather. So I don't have snow boots, I have hunter rain boots, which are not made for snow, but I'm like, I'm out in the middle of these woods with over two feet of snow and I'm like climbing through tr looking for the, the the like pattern of trees where I put Kristen's body with a shovel and uh and Jim's gun and Jim has followed me out there and we have this confrontation in the it was just so beautiful and it looks so cool and I was like cold but I'm sweaty and I can't feel my feet and I'm like freaked out because my dead girlfriend's right here and he's there but I have his gun and I was like, it was just so delicious I was like this is like the madness that I have waited for for like an, a you know a season and a half it just felt like everything was like hatching and it was so just so delicious to do that's awesome all right well we have to wrap it up but thank, thank you, you so much thank you guys you so much. thanks thanks, thanks everybody for talking to you thanks.